You know, you all seem to really like that video that showed you guys how to use plugins to improve your audio in OBS Studio. So I decided I would show you some things that you can do that don't involve plugins that'll help improve your mic audio. What's going on everyone? John from Hobbyist PCs here. In this video, I'm gonna be giving you guys five tips that you can use to help improve your mic audio without having to use things like plugins. So keep in mind that a lot of this is going to involve physical aspects that you can potentially control without having to spend money or even having to download or learn how to use particular programs. Keep in mind that it may require a little bit of time and you may have to have some patience as you'll have to play around with some of these things, but I guarantee that you can improve your audio situation with your mic with just a little bit of patience and time. Keep in mind that I'll also be doing this in order of least expensive to most expensive option. So why don't we go ahead and get right into it. Let's start off with tip number one. We'll talk a little bit about mic positioning. Now, mic positioning is something that can do a lot to change the way that you sound going into your microphone. I'll be using my MXL 770 condenser microphone to demonstrate, so hopefully that paints the picture a little better for you. Okay, so to start things out, I've got the mic about, I don't know, it's about six, six to eight inches away from my mouth. This is usually a really good way to get a full tone from a microphone. I don't recommend that if you're the type of streamer that likes to get very loud, that you have the mic at about this distance if you're using a condenser microphone. So if you happen to have a Blue Yeti, I don't recommend this distance. And one of the main reasons for that is because of the capsule inside of the condenser microphone. They're really susceptible to damage because of how thin the diaphragm is. So you wanna make sure that you don't create such a loud sound source for the microphone that you end up damaging the microphone and it could end up really degrading the quality of the audio coming from the microphone. So if you're the type that likes to get loud, consider distancing the mic further than this. So what I'm gonna do here first, as you can see that this is right in front of me. This may not be the ideal situation for a lot of you considering that this is probably going to obstruct the view of the screen that you're looking at. So what you might want to consider doing is positioning the mic a little further away. So I'm going to go ahead and move this a little further. And I've moved it a little, it's closer to the camera, it's probably off camera now, but I have it about two, two, almost three feet away, it's about two feet away from me right now. This is about where you might see some streamers place their microphone, and as you can see that the audio doesn't sound quite as full, and it's probably picking up more room noise. And that's because of the way that a cardioid pattern works on a microphone, so a microphone will typically pick up a certain area around it, and... A lot of the times it's most focused in the middle. So the, if the capsule is located in the middle of the microphone, the audio is gonna sound most concentrated right here in the middle of it. Whereas on the outsides of it, it's gonna sound uh, not quite as full. It's not gonna pick it up quite as well, but it's still gonna pick up room reflections fairly well. So you might end up getting this sort of hollow live sound. If you don't know what live is, live just refers to a lot of reflections that seem to make its way into the audio itself. So this is something to consider if you're a louder streamer, you like to get excitable, uh, maybe position the mic a little further and make, the, make your adjustments from this positioning. Now, of course, this might not be the most realistic positioning here. So we're gonna try what I consider to be the most common positioning that I see with a lot of condenser microphones, and that's the off-axis setup. Off-axis typically means that you're not talking directly into the microphone. However, you've positioned it kind of off to the side and it's still pointing at you. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go ahead and try to move the mic about 45 degrees from me. Right now, the mic is about the same distance from where it was, and it's off axis. Right now, I have it pointing right at my mouth. This, it's in, while it might be over here, this might be ideal so that way you can keep the microphone out of, out of your, your line of sight so you can actually see your monitor or whatever it is you're gonna be playing your games with. And it also has the added benefit of making it so that by not talking directly into the mic, you end up with less plosives, and I'm gonna get into what that is. But you also notice a tonal shift. The tone isn't quite the same as if you had it right in front of you. As a matter of fact, I would say that it probably sounds the most full with it right in front of you. But again, not everyone's gonna be in that ideal situation. And just to kind of demonstrate what an off-axis sound sounds like at a further distance, I'll move it further away. It might sound a little quieter, but as you can see, it's it's, it's kind of about about two, two to three feet away from me right now. And you can get that sense of what it sounds like off-axis. It still picks me up, but it doesn't quite have the same tone as if you were talking directly into it. And I do want to mention one last thing about positioning. It's not just about where you place the microphone 
like in relation to you, it also matters where you are actually positioned in the room itself. One good way to just ruin the quality of your audio is to just place your desk in the corner of a room or really close to a wall. The reason for this is because the audio coming from you is going to bounce off of the walls, bounce back into the microphone, and it's gonna create this effect that's called phase cancellation. Now I'm not gonna get too deep into what phase cancellation is today, that's an entirely different topic for another video, but the simple concept of what phase cancellation does to audio is what happens is the sound waves will clash with each other because they have polar opposite wavelengths, and it'll create a thinning effect in the audio. It won't sound quite as full as it could. And this is the result of the sound bouncing off of the walls. So when you have your wall a lot closer to you, that effect becomes amplified and you end up getting this sort of thin sound as a result of it. Now ideally, only having one wall in front of you and having an equal distance between the corners of your room is a lot better. Some of you don't have that luxury and this is just one of those things I wanted to point out just in case you wanted to kind of diagnose what it might be that is causing your audio to not sound as good as it possibly could. So what's a pretty good solution for this? Well, for one, like I said, you could position the desk so that it's got equal distance between the corners of your room. But another thing you could do is you could also distance the desk roughly one to three feet away from the wall. You can go further if you want to. Ideally, the best situation is to have the desk smack dab in the middle of the room, but for most of us, that's just unrealistic. So if you're willing to move things around in your room and you really want to get that good audio, I would suggest considering that because it might end up doing a lot more to help your audio than you think it does. Moving on to tip number two, we're going to talk a little bit about gain staging. The short of what gain staging is exactly is simply the act of taking the input gain of your actual microphone or whatever device you're going to be talking into and getting it to a level where you get a good signal going into your source. You don't want it to be too high because if you have your gain set too high, you're going to get what's called clipping and that's never good for the listener. And if you have it set too low, you're going to end up potentially exposing your noise floor in your preamps or in your microphone itself. Fortunately for all of you, I'm going to demonstrate this for you as much as I'm going to hate showing you what clipping sounds like, hoping that my mic survives it. But we're doing this for science, so let's get into this. This is what clipping sounds like. You do not want your mic to sound like this. It is terrible, it's a lot of static, it's a lot of, it's just extremely unpleasant to the ears and if your mic sounds like this on stream you need to turn your gain down you can make up for the lack of volume in your microphone by simply adding some plugins and turning the volume up i'm going to stop this now and i'll show you what it sounds like when you have an exposed noise floor instead i apologize for the lack of footage here but in the original recording i was not able to actually expose the noise floor it seems i didn't get the gain quite low enough and i also added a compressor to the audio to try to amplify the effect of an exposed noise floor it's that hissing that you're hearing in the background no that is not my case fan for my pc this is actually what it sounds like when you expose your noise floor for the most part just ignore the crushed sound of my audio but focus on that hissing sound that's what you want to avoid you don't want your gain to be too low otherwise you will expose this hissing sound and subject your listeners to it so be sure you find that happy balance between the two and you'll be all set so how exactly do you properly gain stage a microphone? Well, it's pretty simple. For one, if you have an audio interface, you simply want to turn the gain knob that goes with your microphone up until you get to a point where the audio has enough headroom so that when you get loud, you won't clip, but also you don't want it to be so quiet that you end up exposing the noise floor. So you gotta find a fine balance between the two. And you can usually test this by doing a recording locally either within OBS or within some sort of digital audio workstation to see where your microphone levels are at and then use that as your reference to you know get your gain stage set properly so how do you adjust the gain if you don't have an audio interface well if you have a headset that happens to have a gain adjuster for your microphone you can simply play with that slider until you get it to a good spot and you could just go into your digital audio workstation or you can go into OBS and you could do local recordings and get it to a spot where it sounds good. Or you can just use the meters that are provided in there. Somewhere around minus 6 dB, maybe minus 3 dB is a good spot. And if you don't know what dB means, it stands for decibels. That's the metric that audio uses. You don't want to be at zero because that's clipping territory, but you want to be below that and you also want to give yourself headroom. So typically I like to shoot for minus six. But let's say you don't have any sort of analog adjustment slider. What can you do? Well, what you can actually do is you can go into your desktop and you can right click on the speaker icon and choose the sounds option. 
From there, you'll see a window pop up that has different tabs and shows all your audio devices. You want to go to the recording tab and then you want to look for your device that's on there. Right click on the device and then choose properties. Another window will pop up and you'll see a few tabs on there. You want to choose the levels tab. From there, you'll see a slider and you can adjust that slider until you get the gain exactly where you want it. So you have a nice balance of the gain going into your device and you'll get a nice clean signal going in. Just play around with it until it sounds the way you want it to sound. Tip number three, use a pop filter or a windscreen. Now this is the first tip that I can give you that might potentially involve spending some money or maybe you got lucky and your microphone has one of these, but a windscreen or a pop filter is simply used to create a barrier between the source and the microphone that keeps wind from getting into the microphone and creating this sort of whooshing sound. Really hard to demonstrate, but I'll do my best right now. As I move away this pop filter, usually what happens when you speak into a microphone, you generate plosives with P and T and B sounds it's because a lot of air is being ejected from your mouth into the mic source. Now, there's a few ways to try to negate this besides a wind filter. You could always set your mic off axis or you could always distance the mic further from you, but that might not necessarily equate to the best possible sound. So some people res will resort to using a pop filter or a windscreen instead. Now I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of a plosive test, so that way you guys can hear the sound for yourselves. Potty people in the place to be. Potty people in the place to be. I hope you guys enjoyed that one. Now pop filters kind of serve like a double purpose. For one, you can use the pop filter to help distance yourself from the microphone. Now if you had one of these pop filters, for example, simply putting it right up to the microphone isn't going to do anything for it. You want to at least distance it a little bit from the microphone so that the air has time to disperse before it hits the microphone. You can't just put it right up against it and expect it to just get rid of this, the wind going into it. It's just not going to work that way. So what you can actually do is you can use the windscreen as a way to distance yourself consistently from the microphone so you're always getting a good tone. Now there are other types of pop filters and windscreens. If you see the microphone in the back over here, this one has a pop filter on it. And that kind of... This microphone is kind of intended to get really up close and personal with, so it's pretty good generally at canceling out a lot of the wind that goes into the microphone, but that microphone also comes with thicker pop filters or windscreens that do a much better job of negating that. And just one more of a bit of an extreme test, I'm gonna just do this real quick. I hope that paints the picture for you guys. Tip number four. Isolate the mic from the desk. Now, for a lot of you guys, this isn't going to be a simple fix. It might involve you having to go out and spend some money, or you might just have to get creative in terms of how you do this. But typically, if you have a microphone that has like a stand or a base that sits on the same desk that you're going to be typing or resting your hands on or playing, whatever it is, if it involves you having to constantly make noise on the surface that the mic is sitting on, you could end up with an issue where that noise is going to get into your microphone and it's not going to be pleasant to the listener. This is why you see a lot of streamers and broadcasters going out and buying broadcasting arms like the one that you see in the background over there. Now this one in particular costs roughly $90, so this isn't necessarily the cheapest thing that you can go and you can buy. However, this isn't the only thing that you have in terms of options. You could also go and buy a regular boom mic stand, so that way it's isolated from the desk itself, and you still get the added benefit of positioning the mic where you want to. Now, of course, the broadcasting arm itself serves many different purposes that are advantageous. For one, you have a much easier time positioning your mic. You can move it on the fly. And if it's a good mic arm, you could also have the added benefit of not generating any noise going into the microphone when you move it around. There are some cheaper broadcasting arms out there that have springs on them that make a lot of noise every single time you move the microphone stand around. Some of them have poor joint construction, so while they might work out fine for a little while, over time they get worn out or they break, and then next thing you know you gotta go out and buy a new boom arm. However, I've found that investing into a broadcasting arm has been extremely beneficial for helping make sure that my mic stays isolated from the surface. What happens is if you're typing, if you're the type that likes to type really hard on the keyboard or you're constantly moving your hands around on the desk or you're the type that slams your fist, anytime you do that and your mic is just sitting on a stand on the desk, it's going to jumble around. And even if you have a shock mount on your microphone, it's going to pick up all that noise and it's always going to be so much harder to filter out with a gate. Getting that isolation from the desk will make it so that you can effectively filter out things like keyboard noise or any sort of button presses from your microphone, allowing you to make sure that 
only your voice is going through it. Not to mention that added benefit of being able to position the mic pretty much wherever you want makes it a very enticing proposition. And lastly, we got tip number five, room treatment. Most of you guys probably know this stuff as sound foam. However, that's not the only thing that is at your disposal in order to help treat the room and make it sound less live or a little better in terms of controlling the way the room influences your microphone. Now I have to mention that this could either be your most expensive option or it can be one of your least expensive options. Really depends on how you approach it. Room treatment is a very difficult topic to get into by itself in a short video like this. It's not something that I can give you all the advice possible to get the sounds results that you're looking for. But at the very least, I can try to explain the concept a little better for you. The idea of room treatment is that if you have a room that's really live, it has a lot of reflections that are getting into your microphone and making your audio sound hollow, then you might want to consider some form of room treatment. The most common way that I see people going about room treatment is they go and they buy acoustic foam sound panels and they will end up gluing those to the walls or thumbtacking them to the walls, whatever method they choose to do it. And that is of course one way you can go about it. The thing is about that stuff is that it's expensive and on top of that, placing it anywhere isn't necessarily going to give you the results that you want. In some cases, it can be more beneficial to just simply place certain pieces of furniture like a couch in your room or even a bed to help absorb a lot of that sound that's getting bounced around us out of your room. As a matter of fact, in my own space down here, I've constructed what are called bass traps to try to suck up a lot of those low frequencies that are bouncing around inside of the room and creating the reflections that are happening inside of it to make it sound so live. Of course, I've got cement walls in this space, so I'm gonna get extreme sounding reflections that are just never gonna be pleasant to the listener. Effectively, what I'm using it for is to deaden the room so that there is less room reflection and there's more emphasis on the lower frequencies being put on my voice. There are some other solutions that you can use, of course. You can put carpets down on the floor. That usually does a pretty okay job of absorbing some of the reflections. You could always hang some moving blankets around your, your walls and your ceilings. While it's not always the most effective thing, it's a pretty cost efficient way to try to get some sound deadening happening in there. You could actually build bass traps like I did. That's gonna cost you some money, of course, but it's a little bit more of a cost effective way to go about it. Or you can use things like bookshelves. As a matter of fact, I've seen some really good room treatment happen by just simply taking a bookshelf and filling it full of books. Just a simple act of something taking up space in your room that doesn't reflect too much audio is just a really good way of helping to dampen the reflections inside of your room and give you that sort of dead sound that you're actually probably hearing right now in the audio. Now, I wouldn't call myself the most qualified to go to when it comes to talking about room treatment. I have studied it a little bit and I was able to take those studies and get sort of a better situation sound wise down in this room. However, if you do want to look into learning more about room treatment, just keep in mind that you're going to be falling into a bit of a rabbit hole there. But there are tons of YouTube videos out there that you can look up and you will find all sorts of information that shows you how room treatment works, how you can figure out what you need in the room, and you can see what the effects of certain types of room treatment do to a certain room and maybe you'll get the results that you're looking for. Before I wrap this up here, why don't we go ahead and I'll show you what it sounds like when you're in a non-treated room. This is just the other side of the basement that I'm in right now, and you'll see the difference between here and in there. I apologize for the darker image, but of course I'm down here in the basement. You see the only room treatment right over there on that side behind that little blanket wall. That's where the, the, the room is I normally film in. So you see it's just bare cement walls. There's some stuff over here, but it's mostly barren and you can hear there's a lot of room reflections in here. Very live, and the, the treatment just had to be done. So hopefully that demonstrates how big of a difference acoustic treatment can make in terms of affecting your audio and your microphone. That of course wraps up this video, guys. I hope it was helpful for you, and if it was, please be sure to rate, comment down below, and be sure to share it with your friends if you found it particularly useful. If you check the description down below, you'll find links to my various social media pages, along with the link to the Hobbies PCs Community Discord. You can go there and ask for tech help, get some advice on builds, or you can just have conversations about PCs. It's a great community, so we'd love to have you. Also, there'll be a link to my Twitch page. I stream twice a week, and it's a great place for you to go and 
get to know me and I can get to know you guys as well. And we can just have a good chat about various PC topics. I would love to have you guys in there. Also down below, there'll be a link to the Hobbies PCs merch page. There you can buy coffee mugs and t-shirts. And I plan to expand the inventory as time goes on. Also, if you want to stay up to date with everything going on on the Hobbies PCs YouTube channel, please be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon for notifications. You'll be notified anytime that we update to the channel. And of course, thank you all for watching and I hope you all have a pleasant day.